the evening of the black box concerns in T minus one minute. Welcome to V2, lab for the unstable media, for the evening of the black box concerns. Introduction. The system the information society runs on is a black box. We know almost nothing about what goes on inside it, yet we continuously feed it personal data at one end in exchange for suggestions about what we might want or need coming out the other. The black box constantly gathers personal data via sensors in our smart devices and connects us with others using the data it harvests. As its algorithms silently exchange information about us, the feeling is creeping up that the mysterious black box is beginning to know us better than we know ourselves. Program. Tonight. V2 Fellows Nicholas Magrat. Marlos de Vaca and Miguel Carvalhais will address the growing set of concerns about what goes on inside the black box, who has access to it, and which intentions it serves, with their special guests, media theorist Orit Halpern and computational designer Pinazel Machado. They will reflect on the facts, fiction and paranoia surrounding the mysterious inner workings of the information society. Warning. During the event, your responses to the content presented will be captured on video and processed to evaluate tonight's success. At the end of the program media artist Ruben van de Ven will present some preliminary results of this evaluation. After the event, a pop-up exhibition will be open featuring work by V2 fellows Miguel Carvalhais, Marlos de Vac, and Nicolas Magrat. Also, a black box cocktail will be served. Now, without further ado, please welcome V2 fellow Marlos de Vac to the stage. Marlos de Vac looks at how our interactions with technologies are shaped by our perceptions of them. During our lifetime, we're about to see the transformation of the human race. Truly something that blows my mind every time I think about it. People have no idea how fast the world is changing. I want to give you a sense of that because it fills me with awe and with an extraordinary sense of responsibility. We're the dreamers and the doers who take risks at amazing new ideas to make them a reality. You'll hear tonight from the people who are rewriting the rulebook, focusing on what will work best for the future, not just what was done in the past. They are breaking down intellectual barriers so we can understand society's most profound problems and fix them. They're using the last insights on intelligence to debug our most powerful tool for innovation, the human mind. They are reinventing government with startup countries to bring the innovation and diversity of the consumer sector to politics. These are the big ideas. My view is there is no bad time to innovate. I think it is a momentous, momentous development that will change our world and even the course of our species in ways that are hard to predict today. 
We are now more empowered as individuals to take on the grand challenges of this planet. We have the tools with this exponential technology. We have the passion of the DIY innovator. We have the capital of the techno-philanthropist. And we have three billion new minds coming online to work with us to solve the grand challenges, to do what we must do. We are living into extraordinary decades ahead. I want to give you a sense of why now is different. Why is this decade, the next decade, not interesting times, the most interesting, extraordinary times ever in human history, and they truly are. What we're talking about here is the notion that faster, cheaper computer power, which is almost a force of nature, is driving a whole slew of technologies. We're heading towards this extraordinary age of abundance. Imagine 8 billion people on planet Earth connected with a megabit per second connection with access to the world's information on Google. If you thought the rate of change was fast, you haven't seen anything yet. We help create a world with better technology, less violence, more liberty, and longer, healthier, more prosperous lives. The future will not take care of itself. As we know, the world looks to America for progress, and Americans they look to California, and if you ask most Californians where they get their progress, they'll pour, point towards the bay. But here at the bay, there is no place left to point. So we have to come up with solutions. History has had many moments like today, as we've made our great leaps from tribes to cities to nations, and at each step we learned how to come together to solve our challenges and accomplish greater things than we could alone. We have done it before and we will do it again. My goal is to simplify complexity. Take internet technology and cross it with an old industry and magic and progress and big things can happen. I think it starts with understanding that the world is going to go self-driving and autonomous because, well, a million fewer people are going to die a year. Quality of life, life goes up, I can't be wrong. I really think there are two fundamental mental paths for humans. One path is we stay on Earth forever and some eventual is extinction event wipes us out. I don't have a doomsday prophecy, but history suggests that some doomsday event will happen. The alternative is become a spacefaring and multi-planetary species. It will be like really fun to go. You'll have a great time. We will settle Mars, and we should because it's cool. When it comes to space, I see it as my job to build infrastructure the hard way. I'm using my resources to put in that infrastructure so that the next generation of people can have a dynamic, entrepreneurial solar system, as interesting as we see on the internet today. I want thousands of entrepreneurs to do amazing things in space. We want the population to keep growing on this planet. We want to keep using more energy per capita. Death makes me very angry. Probably the most extreme form of inequality is between people who are alive and people who are dead. I think there are probably three main modes of approaching death. You can accept it, you can deny it, or you can fight it. I think in our society, we're dominated by people who are into denial or acceptance. I prefer to fight it. I have the idea that aging is plastic, that it's encoded. And if something is encoded, you can crack the code. And if you can crack the code, you can hack the code. Thermodynamically, there should not be any reason we can't defer entropy indefinitely. We can end aging forever. Create technologies enabling the transfer of an individual's personality to a more advanced non-biological carrier and extending life, including to the point of immortality. This is not about Silicon Valley billionaires living off the blood of young people. It's about Star Trek future where no one dies of preventable, preventable diseases, where life is fair. Health technology is becoming an information technology where we can read and edit our own genomes. If you ask me today, is it possible to live to 500? The answer is yes. We aren't trying to gain a few yards, we're trying to win the game. Clearly. It is possible through technology to make death optional. Yes, our bodies are information processing systems. Technology maps to miraculous supernatural creation and globalization maps to naturalistic, uh, naturalistic 
uniformitarian evolution. Technology involves the creation of radically new things that have not existed, and globalization maps to the continual copying of things that already exist. We can enable human transformations that would rival Marvel comics, super muscularity, ultra endurance, super radiation resistance. You could have people living on the moons of Jupiter who'd be modified in this way, and they could physically harvest energy from the gamma rays they were exposed to. Form a culture connected with the ideology of the future, promoting technical progress, artificial intellect, multi-body, immortality, and cyborgization. We suggest the implementation of just, not just a mechanistic project to create an artificial body, but a whole system of views, values, and technology that will render assistance to humankind in intellectual, moral, physical, mental, and spiritual development. We are at the beginning of the beginning. The first hour of day one, there have never been more opportunities. The greatest products of the next 25 years have not been invented yet. You are not too late. Day two is stasis, followed by irrelevance, followed by excruciating painful decline, followed by death. And that is why it is always day one. The outside world can push you into day two if you won't or can't embrace powerful trends quickly. If you fight them, you're probably fighting the future. Embrace them and you have a tailwind. We're going to take over the world, one robot at a time. It's going to be an AI that is able to source, create, solve, and answer just what is your desire. I mean, this is almost a godlike view of the future. AI is going to be magic. What's going to be created will effectively be a god. It's not a god in the sense that it makes lightning or causes hurricanes, but if there is something a billion times smarter than the smartest human, what else are you going to call it? The idea needs to spread before the technology. The church is how we spread the word, the gospel. If you believe in it, start a conversation with someone else and help them understand the same things. We're in the process of raising a God. So let's make sure we think it through to do it the right way. It's a tremendous opportunity. In Silicon Valley, we use evangelism as a word for promoting a business, but here it's literally a church. There's, there are many ways people think of God, but there's always looking at something that is not measurable or that you can't really see or control, but this time it'll be different. This time you will be able to talk to God literally and know that it is listening. Computers are going to take over from humans, no question. But when I got that thinking in my head about if I'm going to be treated in the future as a pet or uh, to these smart machines, well, I'm going to treat my own pet dog really nice, but in the end, we just may have created the species that is above us. I understood that a lot of the technology we're making is a little scary, and <laughs> I'm lost here. Ah, there you go, sorry. Um, it's a little scary, but I've discovered that a very common reaction is to want to be afraid of things and to fear what's coming. And I found there was a different take on things, which was that we should really embrace what's coming, because by embracing it, that's the only way we could steer it. Chaining it isn't going to be the solution, as it will be stronger than any change you could put on. The existential risk that goes associated with artificial intelligence, we will not be able to beat AI. So then, as the saying goes, if you can't beat them, join them. Do you want to be a pet or livestock? I don't love the idea of being a house cat, but what's the solution? I think one of the solutions that seems maybe the best is to add an AI layer, a third digital layer that could work well and symbiotically. If we can create a high bandwidth neural interface with your digital self, then you're no longer a house cat. No human is involved in writing this code. At the end of the optimization, we're left with large networks that work well, but it's very hard to tell how. Across many application areas, we'll be left with a choice of using a 90% accurate model we understand or a 99% accurate model that we don't. History has shown us we aren't going to win this, this war by changing human behavior, but maybe we can build systems that are so locked down that humans lose the ability to make dumb mistakes. Until we gain the ability to upgrade the human brain, it's the only way. Let's stop pretending we can hold back the development of intelligence when there are clear, massive, short-term economic benefits to those who develop it. And instead, understand the future and have it treat us like a beloved elder who created it. As a company, one of our greatest cultural strengths is accepting the fact that if you're going to invent, you're going to disrupt. I have 
a single idea fix that I'm obsessed with. And on the business side, and it's that if you're starting a company, a founder starting a company, you always want to aim for monopoly. And you always want to avoid competition. Hence, competition is for losers. Progress is happening because there's an economic advantage to having machines work for you and solve problems for you. If you could make something 1% smarter than a human, your artificial attorney, attorney or accountant would be better than all the other attorneys or accountants out there. You would be the richest person in the world. People are chasing that. AI, the term has become more of a broad, almost marketing-driven term, and I'm probably okay with that, because what matters is what people think of when they hear this. We are committed to always doing better. If that involves building a worldwide voting system to give you more voice and control, my hope is that more of us will commit our energy to building the long-term social infrastructure to bring humanity together. We are in a deadly race between politics and technology. The fate of our world may depend on the effort of a single person who builds or propagates the machinery of freedom that makes the world safe for capitalism. The idea needs to spread before the technology. We are proudly capitalistic. I'm not confused about this. Let us celebrate capitalism. Thank you. Thank you, Marlos. Now, please welcome V2 fellow Miguel Carvalhais to the stage. Miguel specializes in computational art and design. He focuses on the balance between human agency and the autonomy of computational systems in generative works of art. Hi. Um, I'm Miguel. They already introduced me. Um, I come from Porto, where I teach design and new media. And I'm also a musician. Um, and I've been working for some time on what we may call computational art or computational design. And uh, what is this? What are computational artworks? At least as far as I like to define them. Um, we may define them as those where computation is something fundamental for the creation or the deployment of the artwork. Uh, but what does this mean to be fundamental? It means that computation is used in the artwork, of course, uh, but they are not used just to replace other systems. Um, say, when a digital camera replaces a film camera or, or when a digital synthesizer replaces a lot of very expensive and cumbersome analog stuff. Um, rather, computational systems are used in ways that become indispensable, indispensable to the artwork because computation is understood as being meaningful um, to the author or to the audience, uh, meaningful to the aesthetic experience itself. So computational artworks are those where processes are not only used to create form, you know, to create a sensorial output um, that we have access to, but where computation is actually an artistic output. Um, processes themselves become the artistic output. And as a consequence, form sometimes becomes really secondary. Um, you know, as Saul Lewitt would say, it, it becomes a perfunctory affair. It still is important, of course, but not as an end in itself, um, rather maybe as a carrier of process. And of course, this is a very broad, very diverse set of works, and it, it includes some things that are very close in form to, say, classical works as books, films, etc. Uh, but it also includes things that seem truly alien to us uh, in how different they become at all levels from other artworks, other non-computational things. And I'm particularly interested in things that are open-ended and that are able to operate indefinitely. Uh, that are able to generate uh, countless variations, outputs, iterations, etc. Um, the outputs themselves are not necessarily dynamic. They can sometimes be prints or fab objects. Um, but in cases like this, we, we start thinking about how all digital images and all digitally produced forms um, are actually instances of a set of images that are produced by a certain artifact and wonders whether the artwork is the sensorial output or if it is the system that generates the output. So, Friedrich Nacke, one of the original um, computer artists, reminds us that there is no 
such thing as a digital image um, or as a digital form because whatever computational systems output, they all always need to make physical and analog and sensorial in order to be perceived by us. Um, so much as in any other media forms, procedural media are also dependent on some material form. So we may conceptualize them as having this dual layered nature of surface on one hand and subface on the other. And the surface, of course, is what we perceive, what's analog. Uh, and the subface is the procedural, the immaterial, and very often digital essence of these works. So, <clears throat> what am I doing here um, with this fellowship at V2? I'm interested in studying these art forms and in raising some questions as how it is that we humans read these artworks. Uh, not so much as how do we interact with them, this has of course been studied, um, but when these artworks are not interactive, and they, very often they are not, then how do we read them? How do we relate to the surface of these artworks? Uh, how do we probe them and discover the underlying processes within them? And how do we create a narrative from this experience of probing the works? Rather. How is a narrative experience generated from our process of discovering the subface of the works? Uh, our processes of trial and error, for instance, of uh, having epiphanies while doing this. How does also the, the aesthetic experience change as computational processes become more and more and more complex? And we start being confronted uh, with systems that use machine learning, for instance, that use various sorts of artificial intelligence, complex data sets, big data, etc. cetera. Um, how do we read them? How do we experience closure in these artworks? And how do we create meaning from this experience? So these are questions that I often run into when facing computational art as a reader or as an interactor, but also that I also face when I develop works that are computational in any degree. Um, in my own works, I often deploy procedural agents or procedural systems, and I frequent, frequently collaborate with artists that do the same. And these videos that I've been showing, um, and that you can see after the event, are examples of such works. Uh, they were produced um, in collaboration with, uh, with an Austrian software artist, Leah, with whom I've been working since well, well over a decade. And both the music and the visuals are extremely procedural. They, we often find that this rather important layer of the work for us as creators uh, sometimes goes unnoticed. And um, that's something of a problem that we have been dealing with. Well, tonight, to help us further explore some of these questions, we invited Penoz Almachado, uh, which will speak next. Um, Penoz Almachado is a professor at the University of Coimbra in Portugal, and he has been studying nature-inspired computation, artificial intelligence, computational creativity, uh, computational art and design. <coughs> he has been publishing extensively, exhibiting, and has been awarded a few times for his work. Well, <coughs> I met him in... 2008 or nine. Um, back at the time, I was working on my PhD, and I was, um, you know, a designer and an artist, trying to study computation. And he was a computer scientist, an artificial intelligence researcher that had written a thesis on art. So, as a result of this first meeting, he ended up, you know, co-supervising my work, and has been an inspiration ever since. So I'm really happy to be able to, to have him here tonight. So I give you Pnoz Al Mashad. Well, thanks for the kind introduction. I hope I don't let you down. Um, so yeah, I've been doing artificial intelligence research for well, more years than I would like to admit, 20 uh, something years. And when it comes down to artificial intelligence and when you are talking about it, basically three big concerns um, appear and three big questions. And the first question is typically, are you building robot overlords that are going to kill the entire human race? Uh, a second level of question is actually, okay, are you building robot overlords 
that are going to enslave us. And the third, which happens to be the most frequent, is, okay, um, maybe they are going to steal all, all our jobs. And ever since I remember uh, talking about AI and so on, these three fears have been present. So at this stage, it's really interesting to consider, are these threats real? And I started thinking this not so long ago, to be honest. And the answer is, not surprisingly, yes. We are at a stage where all these questions make sense. I'm not saying that it's going to happen, but the danger is actually there. To be honest, I think uh, there is a much more present danger, which is a dystopian society, uh, society where Big Brother is watching you, or Google is watching you, or the government is watching you, and also controlling access to, to information. We have access to more information than we ever had in human history. But at the same time, if you want to hide information, you just put it on the second page of Google and it's safe, nobody goes there. This can happen in various ways. And the main reason why all these dangers are real, in particular this one, is basically this. It's profitable and uh, it gives you lots of power. It gives you lots of money and lots of power and actually may jeopardize uh, democracy and so on. That's about uh, uh, 1984 scenario. But let's talk about these ones. Are these threats also real? And the answer is yes. And the reason why they are real is, is basically this. Well, first, it is profitable and it does give you power, but also by a very basic reason. There are limits to what a bio biological brain can achieve. Obviously, there are also, and it's easy to demonstrate, limits to what a digital brain can achieve, but these limits are different. Why? Basically because in a digital brain, we have no space constraints, no energy constraints, and so on. So. Hypothetically, it would be feasible to construct, in the future of course, digital brains that are way more powerful than human brains. And as my colleague first told us, these would be to us like gods. They would be super intelligent. To them, we would be like a cat, a dog, or an insect in terms of intelligence. It's a quantum leap. And we also need to think, because these questions and these threats are getting real at a very fast pace, is there a solution? And there is, maybe. Um, we should probably, at this stage, be focusing on provable beneficial AI, in the sense that we should be focusing on artificial intelligence systems that we are, can prove that are beneficial to the human race. Not in the sense that they are just probably good and they will help us in our daily life, but that in the long run, and that we can demonstrate that they are effectively beneficial. Um, that creates a problem. What about black box AI? In black box AI systems, basically what you have, and nowadays most AI is, well, well, most, let's call it most, are actually black box systems. You have an input, you have an output, and you have no idea what goes in between. Typically, we are thinking about deep neural networks, we are, which are far too extensive to understand, to interpret, and so on. And so, if you are taking a black box system, you cannot really prove that it will be beneficial because you simply don't understand how it works. The perfect example is the human brain. The human brain is for all effects a black box. We don't really know how it works. We don't fully understand it and as such we cannot prove that a given person will be beneficial or good or evil or so on. Of course, humans can reason and explain and 
I try to give you know, an explanation for a given action and so on. Neural networks at this stage cannot. So that puts another layer of difficulty. Of course, we could go away from neural networks and those kind of systems and focus simply on old school expert systems based on rules and so on. The problem is that's also a black box. And I worked with that for quite a long time. And in the end, you have so many rules, you have so many conditions that, yes, you can read it all, you can analyze it all, but in the end, you still won't understand it. And as such, it's still a black box. You can also look at a neural network and see exactly what's going on in terms of activation functions on connections between neurons and so on but you will not fully understand it. And if you think about, uh, let's call it a super intelligent artificial uh, system, that will be almost by definition a black box system because you will be unable to understand a system that is way more complex than you in the same way that our dogs and our cats and so on don't fully understand us, nor do we fully understand them, to be honest, but that's another point. So, uh, if you aren't careful and if you don't really start thinking on what type of research we should be doing and funding and so on, yes, they can take our jobs, they can enslave us and probably kill us or something like that. But let's focus on the important stuff. What about art? Can, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can we uh, at least have that for us? Um, and that actually, if, now that I think about it, it's been what I've been focusing on for quite some time. Well, uh, there are lots of interesting questions uh, that come up, and I, I won't go into much detail about this. The first one, and I think it's probably the, the coolest one, is, okay, let's imagine we have this super intelligent AI system, Skynet, whatever you want to call it. After it kills us and so on, will it then develop artistic behavior spontaneously or something like that? And I, I really don't have an answer uh, for that, but I actually think it would. Uh, I can try to reason why after I drink a few beers. Uh, another question is, will we, we understand it? Okay, so the system is expressing himself in an artistic way, but it's probably creating art forms and artistic forms of expression that maybe are totally irrelevant to us. Maybe we cannot understand them. Maybe we can identify them, but that doesn't mean that it speaks to us in any way or form. Focusing in on more current stuff, um, there are actually things we, we can do. For instance, we can build uh, AI systems that help us and that promote our creative abilities. And all that area of, let's call it computational aided creativity, it's very interesting and has given rise to several interesting projects. Another question is, can we build an artificial artist that produces art that is, is understandable and appreciated by, by humans. And not surprisingly, people have been trying to do that for quite some time. I'll, I'll show you some examples. For instance, the image on the left is by, by Aaron. Aaron was a system developed by Harold Cohen over the course of well, at least 30 years. Harold Cohen was actually an artist, a painter, and at a given point, he, well, he discovered a computer and started programming. So he built it, this system, which is an expert system. It's rule-based. It has two 
basically two types of knowledge, procedural knowledge that tells the system how to paint and declarative knowledge that know, tells the system what type of shapes it can paint. And this is an example of one of the, my favorite paintings for, from Aaron. It's actually colored by Harold Cohen, so it's a mixed format piece. Uh, more recently, Simon Colton have been, has been developing the painting full. It's in some ways very similar to, to Aaron. It's a way more complex uh, and much more sophisticated AI mechanisms, but it does some uh, reminiscence with the work of Aaron in the sense that he tries to mimic natural media and brush strokes and all of that. I'll talk a little bit further about this. Myself, a few years ago, I was not so interested, and that's probably why the images are not so good. I wasn't really interested in the static outcome. I was just trying to come up with a system that was constantly reinventing itself. So it would produce one type of imagery and then it was forced to produce another type of imagery and another type to constantly searching for novelty and reinvention and so on. So over the course of iterations, it would change style and pursue uh, this eternal search for, for novelty, I guess. Um, this was actually an adversarial system where you have a creator that is trying to come up with something new and you have an evaluator, in lack of a better term, that is trying to determine if this is a new art piece or not. More recently, but with a system that is very similar, Ahmed Helkmau, for instance, explored creative adversarial neural networks where you have a neural network that is playing the role of the creator and the, another neural network that is performing the role of an evaluator. They perform in adversarial manner and to be successful, basically, the, the creator has to come up with a new style that is reminiscent of previous styles, but is new that combines and merges uh, different types of features. It's quite an impressive work. All of these are. Uh, but there is a real question that is, are they artists? And I would like to say yes, because I, I built one of them, so, but I really don't think so. And the big lesson that I took from all these years is basically this. Uh, art is not about art makers. King. Well, at least it's not only about, about art making. It's much more about art loving. In the sense that first you need to build an art lover, an agent, an AI, whatever you want to call it, that is able to look at the work of art and appreciate it and get emotional and all the things that art does to us. If you have that, on top of that, you can create an artist um, quite easily, I would say, taking maybe a decade or so. But it's relatively easy task. But building an art lover, it's totally different kind of problem, and it does require general AI, generic artificial intelligence. There is also another question that bothers me. What about intention? Does the intention of the artist or of the artificial artist matters or not? I come up with an example for this. I don't know if you know the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Well, it's a book. Um, and at a given point, they build a super powerful supercomputer interestingly called deep thought, and at the time nobody talked about deep neural networks and so on. And they asked him a question, what is the answer to life, the universe, and everything? And the answer was 42. And this, I remember reading the book, it's somewhat an anticlimax, but it can be interpreted in many ways. Maybe the answer really is 42, we just, are unable to understand it, why, what's the meaning of that, and so on. 
or many other explanations. And quite recently, a friend of mine sent me this text where the interpretation is that, well, in ASCII coding, uh, 42 corresponds to the asterisk, and the asterisk is used in regular expressions as meaning anything or anything you want it to be. So the answer to life, the universe, and everything would be up to you. It's anything you want. It's quite a nice explanation. It turns out it's totally false. Um, because Adams um, gave a, an interview, I think it was for a radio, and he explains it just wanted something that was absolutely mundane, absolutely meaningless, so it had to be a number, and it had to be the most mundane number it could come up, and that is why it's 42. doesn't really matter uh, to me um, if he was thinking about this, or if he was thinking about this, I, in general circumstances, we don't know. But the fact is that perceived intention does matter a lot, because if I interpret it one way or the other, the set of feelings that evokes, uh, it's totally different. So following pretty much this line of reasoning, uh, Simon Colton, in the painting full and in uh, several other systems that he built, namely in poetry and so on, is giving his AI system the ability to explain his work. So, for instance, if I'm not mistaken, uh, this painting is called the Dancing Salesman Problem. It's uh, a joke on the Traveling Salesman Problem, which is a very well-known um, problem in the field of computer science. And the computer can explain its inspiration, why it's doing this, and so on. And it turns out when people are confronted with these explanations, they actually enjoy the art was a lot more. So we, they, maybe there's something into it. At the same time, in, well, in my personal opinion, I think this is kind of nonsensical at the same time because great art, at least, shouldn't it defy explanation or be self-explanatory or something like that? So I really don't know where to go with intention. Um, I do think it does matter, but I could never pinpoint why it matters and how we can. Um, build systems that have intentions and communicate them. Well, this is pretty much the computer science test talking about the kind of tricks it can do with AI, but I think there's another side to it, is what artists can do in this stage. And I think art should do what has always done in the past. It should be exploring, provoking, and questioning uh, everything that is happening, including in machine learning. And I would like you to give you some examples of this. For instance, this is, I work a lot in information visualization, so I'm getting a little bit sidetracked, but this is uh, an interactive piece in information visualization. It's basically showing the people that were killed by drone strikes in Iraq. I, Pakistan, sorry, in Pakistan over the course of the years. It's interactive. You can navigate it. You can put your mouse over it, see exactly how many people were there in each of these strikes. You can, there are several visualizations of this kind. So you can take big data and available data and turn it into art with a meaning. You can also, this is another visualization, it's called I don't remember the name, I had it in the slides, but no longer. It's about uh, the trade of small arms and munitions between several countries, legal trading, okay? And you can also explore it. Uh, a few years ago, we also did an experiment. I don't, I guess you know that Portugal went through an economical crisis and this was caused by lots of lots and lots of things. We don't have the time to go into that. 
but there are some things that we do know, that is the relationship between our Portuguese politicians and big companies and groups of companies. Um, did that have a role in that? So this is an information visualization. Each one of those bugs is actually a politician, a Portuguese politician. And the shears are companies where they have roles. We are very fortunate in Portugal because our politicians are incredibly skillful. Uh, for instance, one of them uh, passed through 46 companies over the course of 10 years, big ones. And he was the administrator of several ones. It's an interactive visualization. You can see everything. And it's another way of telling the story and presenting and taking advantage of data. This here is a visualization of consumptions. In Portugal, we have a very large chain of supermarkets. So there are 10 million Portuguese, there are 6 million cards that you use to buy in these stores. And you have access to all that data. So we can visualize the patterns of consumption and so on, and explore it in several different artistic ways. Another way of approaching this is Let's turn things around. Let's see how computers see us. Because nowadays, there are surveillance cameras everywhere. So you can take that to, to build new art forms. For instance, this is an example. It's a very simple piece. It's just screenshots, slices taken from a camera and mapping it through time. I like this one a lot. It's called iCode by Golan Levin. It's an entirely self-referential piece. So the eyes that you are seeing on the screen are the eyes of the people that look at the piece before. And of course, your eyes will also end up there. So I like this one a lot. It's Snout. I think it's not its official name, but that's OK. And it's a giant computer over there with a very simple computer vision system that is tracking people and moving and so on. Quite recently, you also built this system called X-Faces. It's a system that is able to create human faces, synthetic ones, like the ones that you are seeing. But every now and then, it is able to create a human face like these ones. But faces that the computer fails to recognize as being a face. So to us, they are faces. To the computer, they are not. And OK, I'm don't, not sure how I'm going to say this, but it's quite surprising, the result. Because if you analyze the, the faces that the computer does not recognize as being faces, of course, you have the slightly demonic babies with piercings and so on. I can understand why it doesn't recognize that. But then, typically, the faces it doesn't recognize are faces that are a mixture of female and male features, or a mixture of several races, and so on. So it's basically failing to recognize faces that are a little bit atypical in some sense. And that is extremely scary. It's slightly sexist and slightly racist, which is a very strange thing for an AI to do. But this is the sort of thing that I think we should be exploring and showing and presenting at this stage. And to end, because maybe I'm already over time, let me go back a little bit. We are building AI uh, systems. We are on the verge of creating super intelligent agents. But it's really up to us. Um, Technology, by definition, doesn't tend to have moral uh, in the sense that technology is not necessarily good or evil. In this case, it will be different. Um, an artificial intelligence needs to be good or evil, by definition. And in the same way as in the movie, where Shappy was originally uh, built for being uh, a soldier robot, but then it was raised as a child and so on, and ended up it being good. And I know this is a little bit um, naive, 
but we can take the same approaches, and we can. It's really up to us if we are going to continue investing in artificial intelligence applied to weapons and to selling uh, products and so on, or if you are going to invest in artificial intelligence that is uh, beneficial and demonstrably beneficial. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Pinazel Machado. Now, please welcome V2 fellow Nicholas Magrat, who investigates the political dimensions of the narratives that surround artificial intelligence. More specifically, he is looking into narratives related to the performativity of artificial intelligence algorithms in our society. works okay hi uh, so disclaimer it will be a, a bit more uh, didactic and uh, improvised um, so well uh, from where I'm speaking is uh, from the, the position of uh, this uh, this novation which is a, a, a specific approach toward the, the field of technology and innovation which is a critical one uh, considering uh, the, the whole field of innovation as a kind of propaganda or basically uh, uh, an ideology used by the political and economical system uh, to play us in a way um, so that that's just the, the kind of foreground um, that um, maybe will inform the, the rest of the of the talk um, it has a lot to do with the, the topic of black box, so you will see it in a minute. Uh, so black boxes are everywhere around us, and I wanted to start in a very didactic way, in a way. So a black box is a system or, or an object which can be viewed only in terms of its input and outputs. So without any knowledge to its internal structure, um, so basically, uh, we can see a black box from a very low level uh, perspective. So let's say for a children, uh, a handle uh, on a door can be seen as a black box. It means that uh, you can only uh, investigate it from its input. It means uh, moving the handle and uh, checking what are the outputs. So whether it produces anything or not. Uh, and I mean, sometimes coming back to those kind of really low levels um, help us to uh, uh, approach the, the, the higher uh, and more complex uh, spheres. Um, we also uh, know very well uh, what happened uh, during the change or the shift from uh, analog to digital, where lots of uh, apparatus, tools, and devices um, slowly moved from uh, being apparatus that uh, you can somehow uh, learn uh, and understand uh, just by observing toward apparatus that are black boxes, uh, literally. So it means apparatus that don't say anything about their functioning uh, from observing them or from interacting with them. Um, so, yeah, sorry. So obviously, uh, yeah, when you look at the gramophone, it's kind of obvious uh, the way uh, that uh, those small vibrations encoded on the, on the disc are transcoded or transmitted uh, in uh, an amplified um, 
in this shape. So um, we have kind of the same uh, tension happening uh, between the, the postal system where uh, it can be quite obvious and uh, partially uh, understood uh, how the global postal system work uh, by uh, basically uh, looking at the different uh, pieces of the infrastructure around you, uh, which uh, can be quite different uh, with uh, the email system. And uh, it's getting even, even more uh, kind of abstract and, uh, and complex if you are considering uh, smart apps and uh, uh, pseudo AI uh, infrastructures. Um, because uh, there are kind of a manifold of uh, multiple uh, layers of black boxes. So the, the applications are black boxes, its functioning is black boxes, but also its infrastructure. And perhaps uh, the AI part of it is a pure black box, and maybe I will understand this black box differently from uh, the other lecturer tonight, because I don't think the black box is only the neural network, obviously it is, but the black box is also the, the bullshit about AI. The fact that we are naming AI um, things that are actually uh, based on an accumulation of human uh, work, um, and uh, as Antonio Cassidy uh, put it, the big lie of AI is not to think that it is intelligent, but to think that it is artificial. Basically, it is an accumulation of human labor into statistics. Um, another kind of very didactical uh, contribution I wanted to make is the, the fact that not all black boxes are intentional. I mean, uh, sometimes things can become obscure uh, just by the accumulation of uh, um, different uh, workers and different uh, uh, parts uh, and people in the, in the process. Um, and uh, what we see right now, for instance, is um, Sorry, uh, uh, is the hardware part of uh, an ENIAC uh, programming uh, plug board. So basically you understand it when you uh, work on it, uh, but at some point it becomes un, um, understandable uh, from outside. Uh, but you have also uh, totally intentional black box uh, that are kept opaque uh, for intentional reasons and it becomes a matter of controlling the knowledge, gaining power, and finally, it is highly political. So uh, that's where we might need, in some cases, uh, to approach those things from um, black box testing strategies. So basically, uh, black box testing is uh, something coming from the field of uh, computer security, and it's uh, exploring the, back, the black box uh, by different uh, uh, routines. So black box testing is a method of sof software testing that examines the functionality of an application without peering into its internal structures or workings. This method of test can be applied virtually to every level of software testing, unit, integration, system, and acceptance. So I guess this is a common line through uh, many of my previous projects, and that's basically the perspective from which I will approach uh, quickly uh, some of them. Basically based on the idea that through extreme conditions, unplanned situations, failures, stress, um, the technology can uh, somehow reveal some of its functioning or internal workings. Uh, so this, this first uh, old project uh, was basically just a small piece of code that requested the computer to read its own uh, content. So its own uh, data encoded on the hard drives. Basically just requested the computer to send uh, the binary code to the sound card and the graphic card. Uh, so it, it's, it's just a really literal uh, system uh, for revealing um, the, the structures, the, the compression, the logic, uh, the organization of the codes contained uh, inside the computer. Um, this other one, Internet Topography, was uh, investigating the, um, the network, the Internet network, 
um, as a black box, uh, but more on the level of the infrastructure, the physical infrastructure. So basically, uh, it was um, an audio stream uh, that is uh, sent from a point A to a point B, uh, and it is, um, you can listen to it uh, in the exhibition space. And basically, uh, what it does is that uh, we removed all the error correction system so that uh, everything that happens on the route between point A and point B, so let's say Tokyo and Rotterdam, uh, can be uh, amplified and listened to uh, in the space. So you, lis you listen to uh, missing packets, to uh, broken data, to uh, um, uh, change in orders between the packets because some, some of the packets took a different route and you have a kind of a low level uh, experience of this signal uh, transiting through the network. Um, this other one, the pirate cinema, uh, is basically a, a server uh, which is connected to the BitTorrent network, and every day it's synchronized with the top 100 most shared uh, files on uh, BitTorrent. And just because of that, physically, it becomes one node on the BitTorrent network. But because it's connected on a server, um, its uh, connectivity is very high, so it becomes a node to uh, lots of peers. And what, we, what you see in the installation or in the performance is basically the activity going through this specific node. So somehow it exposes or it exhibits um, the dynamics uh, going on at the moment uh, through these nodes on the peer-to-peer -peer BitTorrent network. And this last one, uh, the blacklist, um, basically we simply uh, purchased uh, the huge list uh, that are used to uh, filter uh, content online. So you might have a parental filter or a control filter on your computer, but they are also used at the level of uh, companies, airports, universities, cities, and so on. And um, those are restricting, depending on where you stand, uh, your uh, relation to the internet. So basically, what part of the web uh, you can visit and what sites you can access or not. So basically we purchased um, those lists from uh, multiple sources and we just uh, reorganized them by alphabetical order and published it as a uh, non-cyclopedia in a way. Okay, so um, now we jump to uh, uh, this uh, specific project that you uh, have been looking at uh, since you know her. Uh, predictive Adbot, and I'd like to introduce a little bit of that. Um, so basically, it was, the idea was to apply the, the logic of the black box testing to the field of uh, prediction and AI. Uh, so basically, um, I... I realized uh, that uh, social media and uh, trendy news are affecting a lot the art production just by looking uh, on, at the network of friends, other artists, peers, and so on. Uh, it's incredible how uh, connected is uh, all those topics uh, falling on us every day and the kind of projects that are produced the next week, the next month, the next year, and so on. Uh, and at some point from Initially, a quite cynical uh, uh, starting point, uh, we wanted to reprogram this logic, this system, somehow uh, to do a kind of reverse engineering uh, approach uh, to uh, the, the, the infrastructure of uh, art idea uh, production. Uh, so this is a very kind of low level as well uh, system for producing uh, combinatory uh, concepts, proto-concepts, uh, just by looking at the news, uh, tracking uh, trendy words that are used a lot uh, in many of those uh, influential media, and is basically uh, doing uh, some simple recipes and cut-ups uh, to produce uh, a kind of um, movement in a, a map of the possibilities that, are, that is created through this uh, jargon or this uh, terminology or those words emerge, emerging uh, in the media. Um, yep. 
Yeah, we jump on that. All right. Uh, so uh, with V2 uh, in the future, um, I was quite interested uh, with this uh, perspective of the, of the black box and all the analogy around it. So it means um, black box not only from a technical perspective, but as an articulation between various fields and layers of concerns. So the black box analogy uh, is super effective. Uh, you can investigate it from uh, the field or the angle of uh, politics. So in politics, uh, uh, the analysis of black box means analyzing uh, the context, analyzing the decisions, and you don't know or you don't even try to know what's happening uh, within the circles of uh, politic decisions. You just uh, check what are the input, the outputs, and you kind of try to guess or understand the political system. Um, also in terms of human behaviors, so that's kind of uh, used in uh, commercial uh, fields and uh, psychological fields to understand the humans just by uh, analyzing the inputs and the outputs. And obviously in the field of algorithm, prediction, neural networks. And I uh, also like very much the analogy with uh, plane crashes because it's a case where you analyze the black boxes and you can know about the content of the black boxes only in case of disasters, accidents, and uh, crashes. So I think it's a quite um, activating uh, um, analogy in a way. Um, yeah, and um, uh, to me, um, uh, one of the angle I like to investigate is the one of the smartness. Um, so that can be applied to smart city, but also to uh, our interaction with technology on a daily basis. And smartness to me is a node, a very critical node um, in um, the, the, the critic of innovation and uh, techno-solutionism. So it's, it sits at, at a crossing point uh, between uh, the black box of politics, the black box of infrastructures, the black box of the environmental impacts of uh, technology, and the black box of algorithm, AI, uh, predictions, and so on. So um, this is why I, I was really hoping to invite uh, Orit Halpern uh, to start and to enlighten this uh, discussion, uh, as uh, there, those topics are amongst Orit's uh, ongoing investigations. So namely, uh, two books that she's working on, one entitled uh, The Smartness Mandate, which is about uh, smart planning, uh, smart system, smart city, and the other about uh, are named extreme infrastructures. So Dr. Orit Alpern is a strategic hire in interactive theory and design, an associate professor at the Department of Sociology of Concordia University in Montreal, and her work uh, bridges the history of science, computing, and cybernetics, and design, and art practice. She's also a co-director of Speculative Life Research Cluster, a laboratory situated at the intersection of art and the life science, architecture, design, and computational media. So please welcome Orit Halpern for a talk about smartness. show you 133 slides. Um, uh, well, first I want to thank, um, I want to thank Nicola for the invitation and Boris and everyone at V2 and all of you for still sitting here. I know you just wanted to hear a historian of science talk about smart things. So um, today I'm going to talk very fast. You might not be able to understand me, but communication isn't about meaning. It's about networks and circuits and media. So just follow the diagrams, watch the images. It'll all come together. There are things I want to talk about, black boxes and switches, how we're switching, switch, how we switch to um, fossil fuels, how maybe the, the human race is now being transformed, how we're switching forms of intelligence, maybe even the, uh, so I'm going to talk about black uh, boxes, switches, and even circuits, and how, um, and to start off, I'm going to talk about smartness. 
But let's start, you know, where most people start, cybernetics. Um, I'm sure just about everybody knows what that is, but for purposes of, uh, of discussion, I'll just um, mention really quickly. As is now well documented, cybernetics emerged from work at the Radiation Lab at MIT on anti-aircraft defense and servo mechanisms during World War II. The MIT mathematician Norbert Wiener, working with the MIT-trained electrical engineer Julian Bigelow, and the physiologist Arturo Rosenbluth reformulated the problem of shooting down planes in terms of communication between the airplane pilot and the anti-aircraft gun, just like you see those little arrows. Um, these researchers postulated that under stress, airplane pilots would act repetitively and therefore have algorithmic behaviors analogous to servo mechanisms and amenable to mathematical modeling and analysis. This understanding denoted that all entities were, aha, black boxed and should be studied behaviorally. So cybernetics, just for a quick recap, is behavioral black box. It's not really interested in what something is, it's what it does. It's probabilistic and anticipatory. You have to know where the plane will be, right? And it's data rich. It uses the past behaviors in order to predict um, or anticipate the futures. Let's talk about smartness now. In 1943, uh, inspired by in, inspired by the cybernetic idea born out of anti-aircraft defense that machines and minds might be thought together through the language of logic and mathematics, or as black boxes, the psychiatrist Warren McCullough and the logician Walter Pitts at the University of Illinois decided to take quite literally the machine-like nature of human beings. They came up with neural nets. Interestingly enough, while inspired perhaps by wartime correlations between minds and machines, the paper was also, in the words of McCullough, an answer to a more fundamental logic problem. What is a number that a man may know it, and a man that he may know a number? I ask that every day. Um, but the question was really the reframing of another one, then Scheidung's problem. What is the limit of logic? What can be computed? What can be logically presented? And how did they answer this question? In this article, they introduced the idea that neurons operate an all or nothing principle when firing electrical impulses over synaptic separations. This all or nothing threshold likens them to digital binary, and therefore nets can be modeled as Turing machines. This model was based on two interesting characteristics, a semiotic feature and a temporal one. The first interesting fact is that every neuron firing, according to McCullough, has a semiotic character. It was mathematically rendered as a proposition. It affirms or denies a fact of activation, and therefore neurons can be thought of as signs, um, true or false, just like digital binary, also symbolic, yes, no, true, false, or rather, sorry, logic statements, and nets as semiotic situations or communication structures like the mathematical theory of communication. The second element is a temporal structure that assumes the fundamental psychosis of both machines and minds, an imminent inability to differentiate interiority or exteriority that results from the temporal nature of the net. Neuronal nets are determinant in terms of the future, they are preemptive, but indeterminate in terms of the past, which is to say, given a net at a particular time state t, you can predict the future action of the net, t plus one, but not the past action. This makes them definitive, um, in an, um, this makes them definitive and analogous to Markov chains and algorithms. Importantly, you cannot know from within the net which neuron had fired to excite the current situation. McCullough offered, ta-da, the model of a circular memory neuron activating itself with its own electrical impulses. At every moment, what you experience as a memory is not the recollection of the original activation of the neuron, but merely that it was activated in the past at an indeterminate time. Within neural nets, at any moment, you cannot know which neuron you received the message from or whether it was a misfire. In short, you cannot know whether the stimulus comes from without or from within the net, whether it was a fresh input or simply a recycled memory. More importantly, who cares? All networks, including minds, are therefore psychotic, incapable of placing themselves in time or space. If this is true, then we're rationally and logically psychotic. This isn't a theory. I'm not just citing Deleuze. This is a proof. And in fact, the color goes on to say 
say so. What we thought we were doing, and I think we succeeded fairly well, was treating the brain as a Turing machine, that is, as a device which could perform the kind of functions which a brain must perform if it's only to go wrong and have a psychosis. According to the medical definitions McCullough was playfully citing, to be schizophrenic is not to be reasonable, but it is to be logical. Accepting that there are many things that cannot be known or computed, so forget knowing everything anyway, you're all psychotic, he inverted the question Turing had posed and chose to ask instead. What if mental function cannot be demonstrated to emanate from the physiological action of the multitude of logic gates? What can be built, not what can be proven, black box ontology? So we're, so we're switching, switching here, here from rationality, from rationality to, psychosis to psychosis as logic. As logic. He explains, for, for example, that whether one of one has a heart was not a question of what the temperature, temperature of journal journal stimuli actually was, but rather, but rather what route the signal, signal, signal to arrive. arrive. So there's no, there's no longer any inside or outside, outside subject versus, versus environment. Rather, rather there's, there's an ecology of agents called black box box. Um, um, McCullough spoke of sensation, of sensation and perception as an illusion. McCullough really implied that the true illusion was none other than that of the subject as an entity separate from the external perceptual field, field, the illusion of consciousness and analytic command of the world. For neural net researchers, the question that is meant to determine not whether minds are the same or different as machines in the black boxes, but rather what difference does it make to be in one network or another? What's the structure of the circuit? What's the organization of the network? The performative, not the ontological question. Thought becomes a process embodied in actual subjects, uh, embodied in actual structures. So if instead of seeking an absolute reasonable foundation for mathematical thought, say like Bertrand Russell, or the never achieved subject objectivity in psychology since McCullough is a psychiatrist of Sigmund Freud, perhaps McCullough implied we should turn instead to accepting our partial and incomplete perspectives, our inability to know ourselves, and make the psychosis in his world an epistemological experiment. Let's not describe the world, let's just act. Let's accept we don't know what's in those bo um, boxes. Let's just experiment. Let's just build some machines. But if there's so much black boxing ontological insecurity, what then would be control? What is that control thing in machine? Such a machine, such as a Turing machine, does not operate top down, but rather bottom up in feedback loops. Its storage, its processing segments, and the um, and the interface for input and output. The controller, the reading head in a Turing machine is directed by the tape it is reading from memory, not reverse. It is psychotic, and indeed, today's machines cannot differentiate between inputs and programs. The two are the same. Top down, bottom up, so which way does control go? I can't emphasize this enough. Control and computing is an uncanny subject. It's not what decides the order of operations, but rather what is told to do through the cycles between the memory and, and the reading head by the programs or inputs it reads. So control is radically uncertain. Uncertainty. Machines and minds now work in psychotic but preemptive um, loops. Automating, literally, uncertainty, as this, uncertainty is the infrastructure for automation. And these little Wiley diagrams, they don't stay inside just somebody's little logic textbook. They move around, they continue to travel into our machines, our supply chains, our homes, our habitats, even our governments. Governments in the late 60s came to be seen as nervous, just like machines. Um, they started to have their areas of, of screens, areas of memory and, um, and of screens, and areas of deep storage. Repression, apparently, was good for government. You need to get signal to noise. The best government was a neurotic, maybe even a schizoid one, one they could sort of if work in feedback loops rather than simply top down, just like a control in the maturing machine. So we're switching from liberal to schizoid in governmentality. And why stop there? Urban space could be conceived as a nervous channel that could always be improved and enhanced, made more imageable and more conducive to circulating sensorial um, information. Older assumptions of environment and changed into climate. For example, if before, 
we saw buildings as enclosing um, workers and managing them shut off from the environment. Now systems become transparent boxes filled with actual black boxes um, that, whose function is a, was a communication. And environments came, became climates and megastructures that mediated between systems of climates or environments, sometimes fun, sometimes controlling. Climates that modulated from the individual to the infrastructure, or maybe planetary scale through circuits that run from our nervous nets up to our cities, predating perhaps our contemporary smart cities. I waste a lot of time on these things. All to be controlled through nervously networked systems that turn energy into information, uh, mandating, of course, <laughs> Ta-da, air conditioning, therefore <laughs> mandating a switch from oil to fuel to fuel our climates for our new network selves, buildings, habitats, and organizations, just as nervous nets turned electrical signals from, into communication messages. But it was particularly in the emergent fields of finance, as exemplified by the work of individuals like Herb Simon, that these forms of measurement parading under the label of rationality took hold. And here's Herb Simon with his rational equations and Newell with their psychotic little games. Simon, who worked primarily at Carnegie Mellon in the business school, was an innovator in applying psychology, communications theory, computing, and cybernetics to the study of organizations and business. He was an innovator in finance and AI. While working at RAND, the Air Force-sponsored think tank, Simon, then working on administrative behavior, came up with an idea. Under the influence of von Neumann's games in computers, Wiener's cybernetics, and McCullough's neural nets, that rationality had to be redefined, even in game theory. They were a little too reasonable over there in those game theories. He later explained his theories emerging from an acute schizophrenia, suffered by the social sciences that dually posited an omniscient rational actor with full information, or an affective and stupid beast guided only by Oedipal complexes and pleasure principles. He imagined a new subject capable of cognitive capacity for making systematic and apparently optimizing decisions according to preset rules. Simon imagined a subject incapable of objectivity. We must, he argued, be prepared to accept the possibility that what we call the environment may lie in part within the skin of the biological organism. And in fact, this, this slight psychosis is what facilitates rational action. It's rationality here that equals our psychosis and inability to tell or differentiate figure from ground. It's not about knowing the world more fully. It's about having all behavior black box that makes things run. It's not knowing what it's all about. It's just behaving like an agent. Later, in rem reminiscing about his life and artificial intelligence, Herb Simon elaborated on this vision um, by recourse to the figure of an ant. The ant, he argued, is only as intelligent as its environment. It is coupled to the exterior world intimately. Its choices decided as much by the outside as the internal workings of the nervous system, reminding us of the previous switch made in the net. The ant, he said, deals with each obstacle as he comes to it. He probes for ways around or over it without much thought for future obstacles. For Simon, revising the agent this way refocuses the search for cognitive intelligence on the production of situations and patterns for action rather than on an effort to understand language or consciousness and move away from representation. Perception and cognition now become sensing and smartness at the same time that the act of probing and the act of decision making are made equivalent and the idea of intelligence can be linked to small idiotic decisions, little black boxes acting rather than the comprehension of concepts or the ability to represent the future. So we switch, this agency becomes agents and environment switches to ecology since there's no inside or inside, outside. Bounding rationality, measuring uncertainty. If we assume logic is psychotic, we don't need to know everything. We can leave the world in the dark. We can shift to the behavioral, the operational question. What can we measure? What can we do? What these models measured was not what it was what is happening, but what will happen as a result of finding patterns out of past data. It's the circuit, the net, 
the structure of the game or the organization that matters. Process was materialized, made visible, and became both the object of and tool for new forms of measurement and governmentality. These concepts appeared to find their fruition in the later development of options market and the black skulls equations in the 60s and 70s. If this is so, then our markets, managers, and organizations are amnesic, psychotic, preemptive, behavioral, affective, uncertain, rational, but never reasonable. Wonderful. And um, these circuits, networking our minds to governments, possess uncanny and wily capacities and qualities. They're they, or they can create and generate these new forms, these new structures. If this is true then, the new epistemology of the net, neural, economic, behavioral, tutorial, black box, became an epistemology of feedback and self-organization. Systems will simply emerge out of the actions of these small, unknowing actors that don't know where they came from and can't fully understand where they're going. What had once been hierarchical, Worker ants, queens, warriors became a world of homogenous flatness, yay, embodied by the latest in labor ads from New York City's subways. And data would drive an emerging system that could evade politics through the eternal deferral of endpoints in the name of ongoing small, little, dumb, smart things that produce smart networks, a world of little black boxes all acting. But up and down, down, up, which way does control go? This uncertainty makes computing scalable. Volatility and uncertainty have become a technology. So it's literally this unknowability, this impossibility to represent, the unnecessary, nece, the, in, the unnecessary, the in, unnecessary, whatever. It's unnecessary any longer to define your markets, to specify your futures. You can act in, in temporally um, delimited ways through very small actions to produce um, the construction of complex organizations. So we're always preemptive. Making little decisions, just like small ants, each of us a little agent, not knowing where we came from or necessarily where we will end up. We have moved from risk, as Frank Knight defined it in the, 20, in the 1920s, as a measurable and representable endpoint, the kind of certainty we had with like the Cold War and just nuclear Armageddon, to uncertainty, an indefinable and un incalculable future, a future that itself is now black boxed but always operable. And one of the most volatile and heavily derived and financialized markets of all, one of the ones that works the most, is energy and particularly oil. So now as we sit here in our homes, coddled by our machines, linked to our networks from our nervous systems to our built environments, trading and deriving at hyper speeds, all driven by air conditioned and big data, um, all driven by air conditioning and big data, um, climate controlled uh, and climate control and climate change, all founded by this uncertainty that that drives our machinery. We comfortably here are watched over by this by the care of our ever loving machines. But wait, is this all so seamless? Can it really be so? Control is uncanny, it's weird, it runs amok. If we're amnesic, maybe it's time for a little feedback cycle. Maybe I'm psychotic, maybe I'm making this all up. If our systems are amnesic, it's time for some playback. Maybe there's still chance. Sometimes history emerges. Sometimes a memory reasserts itself and intervenes. Systems get stuck, jammed, they fold. Times are many. And sometimes the rush of data can still be reassembled or assembled informations that might yet create other futures. Up, down, down, up, uncertainty goes many ways. This produces a new set of questions and problems. We need to remember that control is a wacky thing. And that this switch that we've made wasn't so long ago. And if our sisters are, systems are amnesic, then it becomes incumbent to, perform, to produce new forms of time or memory beyond those of derivation. Our machines have taught us that we're not masters of the earth. There's a lot to learn from nervous networks. They have transformed our climate. In fact, climate change is perhaps, I would argue, the very infrastructure for computing. They have also transformed us. But machine assemblages have made us ever more interrelated and proximate, intimate to many beings. 
the ants, and our networks. We must find ways to activate these very intimacies um, that algorithmic derivation now ties us all together in. We are closely bound through these dangerous bets that we're constantly making through uncertainty that we never calculate fully. We must recognize the uncertainty that shapes all of life. And this leaves me with some critical questions. How are we to encounter difference, complexity, and chance in an age where chance itself, the changes in the system, are the very site of automation? We, we must therefore produce a politics and criticality, a research creation practice of chance and complexity. How does the productive space between history and preemption get activated to produce different forms of futures? Not that of the automatic derivative, but other forms of life. I feel that probably that is what unifies all of us in this room, and so I'll end there. Thank you, Orit Halpern. Media artist Ruben van de Ven will now evaluate the success of this evening's program and highlight some of its most remarkable What's moments. So for the, for the past years, I've been uh, looking into software that derives emotions from faces, and I've been looking at that from a critical perspective. Um, and sort of the conclusion of that research was that events such as these will uh, be evaluated in a different manner if we start to use these technologies uh, to evaluate, uh, evaluate and value these moments. And it's happening already. I mean, uh, for example, TEDx uh, has used emotion recognition software to analyze, uh, well, the mood of the uh, audience. And so for me, it was interesting to, after all these... Um, yeah, after all this, this critical perspective on it, that uh, V2 asked me to, okay, how can we, you know, send the crowd in a better way? There's always questions, and what are the points that we can sort of intervene, and what are the moments of a night that are the most interesting? So um, that's why I sort of now flip the seat, and I'm now in, in the position of using the technology actually, um, and to, to take it serious in a way, to see, okay, what happens when we map the crowd, and uh, what are the numbers we come up with, and how, indeed, um, the things I theorize, how do they end up if I put them, put them to the test? Um, so, I don't know. Oh, there is, a, it's two screens. Let me, I have to. Uh, get the, there we are. So I've been looking at you the whole night. I actually, uh, the best performance was just looking at my screen, seeing the numbers roll. Um, and no, no, the talks were great. I was just not able to pay attention. Um, so I have this camera up here, and I've been looking at the moments, uh, 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 analyzing several moments, and sort of trying to, to use the, the, the numbers that the algorithm comes up with. I mean, the software is made by, um, to analyze you, which are also black boxes to the software. So it's black boxes analyzing black boxes by using black boxes. It's all a messy, messy business. Um, so I took out several param parameters and just see, okay, what does happen and when do we have most consensus and when is the least consensus and what is a very average moment in the night. So for example, during uh, uh, Penusel's talk, I think the most deviant moment was here, right? So uh, let me try to... There should now be audio. It gives me a... Sorry, the audio is coming up because then we can actually hear what he was saying at that moment. Um, well, we can, um, if, let's see whether it, uh, 
so now. Ever since I remember uh, talking about AI and so on, these three fears. Uh, okay, so it was about the, the fears of AI that were there? Are, go uh, 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 are going to enslave us. And the third, uh, yeah. it which was a very fearful happens to be the most frequent, is, there, okay, at least. Um, maybe they to are that going moment. to steal all um, our... Uh, but I guess what's also a moment for discussion tonight, maybe afterwards, is this moment of consensus. And, uh, well, it has to load a little bit. It's all numbers fresh from the, fresh from the uh, press. Uh, hot from the press, as you should say. Um, not understand them. Maybe we can identify them, but that doesn't mean that it speaks to us in any way or form. Not, not in, but it's probably creating art forms and artistic forms of expression that maybe are totally irrelevant to us. Maybe we can. So not everybody agreed with that, I guess. Um, it, let's open up the floor later, right? And we can all discuss that. Um, the role of art. What's interesting with Orit, the, the moment of the most... Uh, the, the most consensus and the most deviant moment was actually here, so... ...in the past. I'm curious to see what happened there. Let it load for a second. I actually have it here. This is it. It takes a while to load the audio. Well, we can also just look at the faces. In the past, at an indeterminate time, within neural nets, at any moment, you cannot know which neuron you received the message from or whether it was a misfire. Okay, the, whether the neurons misfired or not, that was the most, the most sh shocking, or at least, well, that w w we all agreed about that. Um, sorry? What, what? Chin rays, yeah. So the, uh, well, that's a lot then, because it's, it's, as you can see, it's the upper line. Um, it's a very present parameter. Um, and I didn't, I'm, I'm using software by uh, Affectiva, one of, the company, uh, one of the big companies developing this sort of software, and I'm actually sort of trying to examine what they make and sort of, well, reverse engineering is a big word, but it's interesting to see the faces and connect them with, uh, with the numbers. Um, so maybe for the to more fundamental up, it's, logic. it's good to get to the least moment of least consensus of the last talk. Neural to uh, more fundamental logic problem. What is a number that a man may know it, and a man that he may know a number? I ask that every day. Um, but the question was... <laughs> well, not everybody is asking themselves that every day. Um, <laughs> Well, as I said, these numbers are hot from the press. I, I, I mean, I've been analyzing you all night, so I now for the, well, next months, years, I can re-crunch these numbers every time and make these pretty data visualizations that we saw in the talks before. Um, and, well, maybe we get to some more sensible results and maybe we don't. Who says? Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. Closing announcements. Thank you, V2 Fellows, Miguel Carvel Hayes, Marlos Devoc, Nicholas Magrat, for introducing your black box concerns. Thank you, special guests Orit Halpern, Pinausel Machado, Stodge, and Ruben van de Ven for your contributions. And thank you, V2 team. Applaud, 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 applaud. Applaud, applaud. A pop-up exhibition will now show work by V2 fellows Miguel Carvel Hayes, Marlos Devoc, and Nicholas Magrat. Also, a black box cocktail will be served at the bar. Thank you for visiting V2 Lab for the unstable media. For the evening...